One year later and we've looped around to another Halloween. Now last year we covered the obviously terrible Adams Family movie, so of course this time around, we're doing Adams Family too. And with no word on a third movie, because the second movie wasn't as successful as the first, and I guess someone worked out that these movies finally aren't good, and I guess we'd best just make the most of it. Finn Wolfhart has now dropped out of the role of Pugsley since he still has that sparkle of optimism in his eye for being an actor in the Hollywood sphere that the older generation have just lost over the years with their doled down perspective and a couple newcomers have joined the cast as our antagonist but we'll get to them when we get to them. Everybody else has practically returned including Conrad Vernon as director and Lurch and the entire house. So after an incredibly boring story about the housing association in the local neighborhood, where did the Halloween -y family go two years later? Well, for a start, Wednesday is out and about at the science fair, where she of course can produce a Frankenstein's monster type thing, whilst everyone else does baking soda volcanoes. The magic of imaginative spooky stuff. Last time Wednesday reanimated a bunch of frogs and this time... Her uncle Fester ate a Rubik's Cube. Truly some riveting science and groundbreaking innovation. What the actual crux of the science experiment is, is the ability to briefly switch consciousness between entities. You know, trading the lack of intelligence from Uncle Fester for Socrates the Octopus' superior brain. Not the newest idea in the world, but guess it's logical to the character for Wednesday to be tired of her stupid relatives. And yet somehow this movie still seems to make the reveal about as anticlimactic as it can be. That was your big reveal that he's smart now? It's just so uncooked. And this was the thing throughout the entire first movie, mind you. It's inexplicably dull to watch. From the understandably grey colour palette to the uninspired mise-en-scene, it's just underpresented. Going through beats rather than showcasing that childish fun to us. But whatever, show's over now. And since this was all one big competition anyway, it's time for our winner to receive a reward for their contribution to the scientific arts. The winner is everyone who participated! Oh no. This is really gonna be for a certain demographic, this movie. This is the most boomer agenda point I can think of. This movie wants to take a stab at participation awards. No child has ever been offended by the concept before. Only now, in fiction. Now that they've blown it out the water. This is a movie gunning for the lowest common denominator and thinking it has achieved something. So anyway, hologram judge over here, he is Wendy's concerns and offers to partner up to expand her work and is voiced by Bill Hader. Gee, I wonder what contribution he'll be adding to the story. As the scene comes to an end in classic Adams Family the movie, but we're talking about the remake animated version movie style, with random chaos and some pop culture music to plaster over the gaps. Welcome to the mouse. But hey, at the very least, it's nice to see some vaguely creative ideas for expelling out some of these science experiments to their furthest point, and the parents being very on brand. And so after the movie rolls out a little intro sequence with that iconic tune, since this is practically the best thing this movie has going for it, already established IP, we come to see Wednesday mobbing in her bedroom about being unremarkable, more so with her latest trophy, to which she chooses to break Pugsley's neck. Alrighty then, that then goes into a ramble from Uncle Fester about love because apparently that is the arc Pugsley is to go on from this entire movie, despite the lackluster establishment earlier. And then it's dinner time. It might feel like I'm skimming scenes, but it is legit going at a breakneck pace. Come on down here, it's dinner time. Now at this point, I get the feeling that the movie is starting to panic that it's not doing enough to keep retention time up because after two 15 second scenes in a row, we're now to follow Uncle Fester some more on a bizarre barrage of antics to take him to the dinner table. I think this movie is going to give me a headache. And so we're settled at the dinner table with the adults and both children aren't making an appearance. Wednesday specifically skipping for getting too much love and attention, to which our dad Gomez here of course comes to the wrong conclusion for a solution. It's either giving out all the more love, attention and support, or it's the other option that comes to mind. We are going on an Adam's family vacation. That's it. That's the plot. Going out to new environments for antics to ensue. Gone is the territory for callbacks like all the blades thrust into Gomez's chair. I can appreciate that. And so the very next scene, we're introduced to the Adams family car. 
this scene's not that interesting. The men push the children together in one hint of choreography, and there's like one joke. It's a hybrid. Half car, half eye sure. But following that, we have yet another new character popping up. A lawyer. Claiming that there's a chance some babies were switched up and that Wednesday is not theirs. The parents fob it off to Wednesday pulling strings to get out of the vacation and they shoo him away with a tip. They left me these tips in his will. I knew one day they'd come in handy. I can't believe he gave me the finger. Wednesday then has the awareness to notice some guys popped up, but doesn't go on to pursue him for answers because that would be far too intelligent for the canonically intelligent character. And so with Grandmama holding the fort at home, off they roll. And we have to, of course, milk that old classic theme, of course. How else are we supposed to patch up the void of our creative capacity, huh? They vaguely lay out where they're going with, as usual, very little interesting camera work, and also they're being followed. Lawyer Boy now coming with a Lurch clone. And now we're at our first destination, Niagara Falls. This is gonna be the kind of movie that relies on real world landmarks to plaster their environment since creating original and spooky ideas takes effort. Why not just stick to real life parallels to make things easier, you know? They were gonna go to Salem, but Uncle Fester rerouted last minute since Socrates is still in his head sometimes. But only when the plot requests it, for three seconds at a time. The great wonder of the world and kills the most tourists. Though I must admit, Uncle Fester has all the best lines in the movie. I'm not even sure if anyone else is even cracking jokes. Fester has an octo arm, Wednesday is in the same mood as ever, and Pugsley is eyeing up girls. I should totes take a selfie at this moment. Yeah, lowest common denominator for sure. This is just the teenager again from the last movie. I just skinned my knee! Falling for you. Yeah, I see why Finn Wolfhart left. And so following that comes that one moment in the trailer that got milked to death in the marketing, I feel. Wednesday's brought her voodoo lol of Pugsley. What does this have to do with Niagara Falls? Like, couldn't all these beats happen practically anywhere? I know we're now getting a semblance of water content, but like, they're just up on a pathway next to a waterfall. Just on that prompt alone, there's really not much to jump off with, apart from jumping off. Most of this next sequence is just Pugsley floating midair because there's not much else to do. Oh, right in the Niagara Falls. Oh, okay, never mind. That, that makes the whole location worth it. So after buying 300 pickles, Gomez then goes off to kill his family right here by chucking them into open barrels and kicking them off the edge. Not actually in the waterfall, just off the cliff. Logic in every direction be damned. And the lawyer guy pops up, is immediately spotted, and then chucked into the falls, and then never reiterated further. Instead, our focus is prioritized towards... Ah, there he is. <sighs> this movie is so stupid, man. So Wednesday thinks Gomez is dying since he's erratic, Morticia doesn't correct her, the lawyer man is just gone, and the movie continues for another hour for some reason. And Wednesday never brings up the dead thing again, actually, now that I'm here afterwards. And it's a shame, because the water simulation looks amazing. Talented people were involved in this movie and just wasted two years of their lives on some higher-ups drivel. And now with quality like this, I'm starting to miss Finn Wolfhart. Grandmama's partying with teenagers, Skip, and Gomez is telling fireplace horror stories, Skip. Wednesday, you were the opposite. I've never heard of a baby being completely silent before. Well, I imagine dead ones were pretty silent. And speaking of babies, Uncle Fester goes on to ramble about the time he juggled a bunch of babies on Wednesday's birthday to help calm them all to sleep, confirming the chance that Wednesday was swapped out at birth. But they also clearly show that she's different looking and in the correct family crib, as if to spoil the twist later that she is in fact theirs anyway. She might not be our daughter. Yeah, she is. And so our next scene takes place. Oh, brother, it's more of the same night! Now Wednesday needs to brood out and about. She already did that. Can we just move on? We're not even at location two on this vacation trip and we're one third done already. Skip. So we've made it to location two, beach. It's just beach. And as Wednesday reads about how to give head, we're given a montage of antics. Morticia sun cream, sandy guillotine, sharp fester. And then it comes and joins. Ladies, what a lady say. Ladies, what a lady say. This whole scene was one big mainstream song, and then they mashed another on top of it and called it content. But hey, at least they referenced the Jaws dolly zoom and basically the original Adam's concept art, beach and all. 
Uh, welcome to Halfway Through. Here's a reminder to subscribe if you haven't already. And since the Christmas season is soon upon us, let me know about any terrible seasonal movies you'd love me to point at and laugh. Or just give us a like to show your support. I never ask for those. I probably should. So after Pugsley sleepwalks and it is consumed by the lion for a while, he has a heart to heart with Wednesday. And honestly, I spent more time just listening to his dialogue forwards and backwards since I watched this through my editing software and it's just more interesting. Turns out, it is fully communicating with Wednesday's words. Here, let me give you some more extracts. I shaved my whole body as a teammate. It was a Brazilian time to trip. You shaved your entire body as a teenager? Did it ever bother you that you were so different? It used to. The name as a teenager was because I was Harry Elkins, the one. You, you owned who you were. What it is? Good. All good. <laughs> Imagine being a schmuck who can only understand one half of the dialogue in this scene. How unimpactful and annoying that must be. So continuing on the plot, our lawyer boy is back on a moped for some reason. I don't remember them losing their car beforehand. He just fell into water, but now there's motions to be had. Vaguely, being vertical and making one bridge. Truly groundbreaking stuff. To which the parents distract the kids to the table and solve their issue with... How about Punch Buggy? Uh... That's it. Nothing to do with the kids. If anything, bringing them closer to the window than they already were. And putting it to lurch instantly. Lawyer Boy is now defeated in a random pile of poo on the side of the road. You know, that classic Texan landmark. Wednesday still spotting it and doing nothing. Location three is the Alamo. Tell. Which actually boils down into a children's beauty pageant, which is a choice. Everyone just goes along with it, I guess. Wednesday is forced to take part, but she makes the most of it with a genuine highlight here as her talent is that she can read minds. Hello, Peggy. All right, I'm not fully sold on the low voice at the end, but it's nice to see something genuinely well presented. Wednesday is a cool character in concept. So the beauty pageant is in fact a choreographed dance with no practice attached and Wednesday looks awful. And the whole bit is that she wants to leave, but she can't from all of the motion that they're doing. And like, it's so badly done in every way. The singing, the choreo, just the idea and the voice delivery too. Kiss when I'm dancing in the show tonight. This show is so poor, I almost feel bad for the pedophiles that are probably in this room. So much so that Lawyer Boy walking in doesn't recognize her. She dumps the other girls in paint. Lawyer Boy does spot her. And then Gomez dogpiles Lawyer Boy by claiming he's a talent agent so everyone goes wild. It's it's a story beat, I guess. But just really, really poorly put together. You know, it's the running theme for the Adams Family animated franchise. And then Lurch is beckoned to get them out of there. After legit eight seconds of him saying, what? Because the runtime's looking a little thin, I guess. Leading to the most obvious parallel you would expect to make with this roster. I'm sure they'll make out later. Next scene, Wednesday actually questions Gomez about the lawyer man and he doesn't give a truthful answer. So she moves on, knowing he's lying, but doing nothing to pursue it. Yeah, this movie is just outright wasting our time now. Location four, if you count the gas station, is the Grand Canyon. Just another cliff to stand next to. America has all the best landmarks. And though they chuck in some random gags about it partying all night or something, the first beat of this place takes place in a public bathroom, as Fester's body changes are finally being addressed. What? This was honestly the best six seconds of the whole transformation. The rest is pretty underwhelming as it's just arm pulling and a single eye poke, all being off screen on the floor. So we're finally here, the Grand Canyon. Great to the Adams for being one big void. And then immediately it's interrupted by a private jet. Nothing to do with the canyon. And actually it's for it. Now he's leaving. Arrive to say hi, give Snoop Dogg a paycheck, give out heart to hearts and then leave. Words of wisdom and more wastes of time. Why didn't I get dating advice from him? The ladies love it cause I don't give up. And on that bombshell, off he pops. Time for random emotional beats as Morticia gives Wednesday a family heirloom necklace that was not mentioned at any point before. And also I don't think fully makes sense based on what she says. So her direct quote is, this has been handed down through generations of Adam's women. But like, she's not an Adams woman. I mean, sure, she is now, but in the classic rendition, she was born a frump. Obviously, right? Grandmama Adams is Gomez's mum. He's the Adams tree. So Morticia's mother 
wouldn't be an Adams at all. And also, apparently Morticia's mother gave her this heirloom on her wedding day. We saw her wedding day, by the way. This is just not true. But I guess here, the special occasion to bring it down is... Wow, look at Cliff. Wednesday's slightly perturbed, so here, cheer up. If this movie didn't have every other trait that this movie has, I'd think there'd be a writing explanation for this hole. But you just know there is not. Hey, sorry, are you getting bored in this movie? I have just the fix for you. <laughs> yep, when in doubt, just blow up everything with the most cliche classical music on top. That'll make the kids pay attention. And that's the end of our scene. Blow it up just to run out of here. But very suddenly, we're with Wednesday, inexplicably on the side of the canyon, away from the family, in the sunset, and Lawyer Boy just popped up. <laughs> and for the next few minutes, we're gonna get our full-on conversation of explanations, also known as exposition dumping. Now sure, maybe sharing all this information is a good prompt for dumping, except almost none of it is actually shown. There's one shot of a reminiscent point of view shot from a scene earlier in the movie, but the rest is just talking. Not to Lawyer Boy, but to Bill Hader, the science guy. Rambling about how he thinks she is his long lost daughter since they were born in the same hospital. Plus she's good at science and they have big heads. That's all. No throwback to that day at the hospital, no visuals on the failed child they had instead. Just talking under a tree, on the phone, with none of the creative flair you would expect from this naturally creative industry. This has always been a franchise to tick boxes and mute art. Until the very end of the scene where... What did you do with Mr. Mistella? I let him go. And so after a scene with only dialogue, naturally, it's time for a scene with only montage music, of course. And thankfully this time, it's not just a random jukebox piece, it's more of that genuine Adams Family soundtrack score, which I must admit, is pretty good whenever it actually comes out. The consistent use of the more spooky instruments all come out quite nicely, because again, the individuals that made this movie are pretty damn talented. Just misused. Anyway, in the night, Wednesday is making her own DNA test on her father. He apparently sleeps in his identical clothes and without Morticia, and she confirms that she's not, in fact, an Adams. Ah, they're gonna write their way out of this one. And so, next morning, she has all but run away. Your typical stuff. And I guess now that the story's not trying, the visuals faintly are. As we get to see that Wednesday sleeps in a morgue bed. Nice. And wow, we actually get a flashback of her leaving? That's vague effort. Then the family lament, and as for the jokes... Bloody dog! Don't forget to clean behind your knuckle! <sighs> Even Uncle Fester has lost his chaotic spark. And so Wednesday is off gallivanting to find her real family on foot, out in the wilderness, only for a mild twist to follow us, as Lurch has chosen to follow her. And yet again, we have a heart-to-heart -heart with a character the audience cannot understand. I guess that's true. You're not an Adams either. I feel like this was a conscious choice for the audience to fill in the gaps of good, heartfelt dialogue writing. Is that a conspiracy? And so, with Lurch accepted to join along the way, the two of them continue. Where to? To Sausalito! Thing to Sausalito! How do they know? It wasn't in the letter. Come on! How do terrible movies have cliche traits that are only followed by other terrible movies? Death Valley. It's location 5-ish. Again, not really a landmark. It's just another void. The open desert air, where nothing specific can happen, just normal scenes and a vaguely different background. But I guess it's an opportunity to see a type of person, biker dudes. And though we do briefly get some genuinely nice sky sunset lighting, we'll be next diving right into a bar for our next beat. Every landmark seems to have a normal interior set to go to. And so Wednesday and Lurch barge into this bar, only to be immediately antagonized by the whole saloon gang. It's a standoff of tension until Wednesday commands Lurch forwards to show just what his cold dead hands can do. First I was afraid. Uh, I mean, I guess it is subversive. The power of song then forces everyone to move to the beat of the rhythm. Looking like one of those cringy illumination dance sequences, it's one big disco. This movie came out in 2021, so it's not even like it's outdated. And of course, ruining all of Wednesday's initial plans for a big bra brawl up. But the conclusion still comes out the same the moment she mentions Sausalito. Sausalito? That's exactly where we're headed! And thus, they join along the ride. I will survive, still playing in the background so I can't show you any more until she finally reaches her destination. A random house that I guess she already knew the exact location of. And so as her and Lurch slowly make their way into the building, we come to learn of the other family members attached to Cyrus Strange. <laughs> Wednesday, meet my wife. 
Our little loaf. The other me. Oh no. This movie is going to be a whole new level of black-hearted, isn't it? I mean, it already has the theme of a father who doesn't appreciate their child and thinks they're someone else, but even in their presentation, they're like bird and pig mutants. If it doesn't turn out that they are literal science experiments, then this is just going to be some ugly-looking caricatures to make fun of less able demographics. You know what I mean? These characters being designed like this makes me feel an ick. So anyway, Wednesday is introduced to Stranger's Big Old Lair, expositing some more about the similarities the two have while doing a DNA test. About how your formula was a family secret. And of course this being the crux of it all. And so the DNA tests come back as a match, how perfect, just as the Adams family make an appearance outside. Again, how do they know? Did Wednesday leave a postcode to this guy's place in the letter? No. It's my fam- uh... The Adams family. And so they rock up, fully confronting everyone in the front yard as Wednesday now dons a lab coat and turtleneck, showcasing the evidence that she, in fact, is not an Adams. And before long, we're back to laughing at non typical children again. We went through the same thing with Ophelia. <laughs> Wasn't it kind of a progressive theme for the Adams family to showcase a less than normal character dynamic in a way that wasn't pejorative and spiteful? Isn't the message of the Adams family IP to not judge a book by its cover and understand that even odd characters can be endearing and they're all real people? How do you misinterpret the original text to the point we're practically pointing and laughing at a character that's a little ugly and weird? Well, the movie tries to turn it around as Pugly falls head over heels for them anyway. I still think it's pretty black-hearted. So as Wednesday is about to say goodbye to the Adams family, she comes to a pause and instead suggests they stay the night to say goodbye tomorrow instead. Padding. I'm not quite ready to part with them. Forgive me, father. And thus begins our sad montage. Honestly, the only part that vaguely depresses me is seeing Lurch was taken with Wednesday. I really don't have the emotional connection to care about anyone else. Maybe pity for the poorly presented wife character? Yeah, okay. Movie can't even commit to the emotional beat. There is a slight gag here I like, that the two have so many memories together in the six hours they've united, but also... I don't feel like six hours passed at all, and none of it really ties together, but also during this montage, Pugsley is hanging out with Ophelia, eating face first and all that, until... <laughs> oh, so she is a literal pig, and he still can't act. Does that excuse the weird choice in including characters like this? I don't know, but I still have the ick. That's just it! I, I don't think they are people! Uh, oof. But it's a conspiracy for the Adams to unravel and breach Cyrus's lies. Oh no, he's here. Immediately to address the full plot, okay. Her experiment did what you couldn't. And then they also confirmed that he faked that DNA test. But like, weren't there two? Sure, I can see how Cyrus manipulated it when it was his own machine, but Wednesday did one out in the middle of the wilderness with her own resources and almost every type of hair on Gomez's body. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't go searching for any more hair on his body here, huh? Could you imagine? I don't want to. Strange didn't contribute to that one. Is this gonna be addressed? So now Strange has a super lair and Wednesday has fully perfected the formula for him. Now he's much more giddy, spouting secrets. And the moment Wednesday sorts everything out for him, despite occasionally mumbling out suspicions of her own, they can be our first test subjects. Just immediately going for a short term success thing rather than gaslighting her for a much longer period to gain all sorts of unknown scientific benefits in the future, you know, Basic, boring villain stuff, really. So the two go on a right long argument. Turns out Strange does want to keep Wednesday around, just making the Adams her pets first to eradicate the less desirable traits. All the while selling this new tech to governments to get stupid rich off the science. That kind of thing is the logic to this villain. They're fine as they are. Except for maybe pugs. The argument continues as Strange starts up the machine. Naturally, it takes three working days to get going as Wednesday stands her ground and makes her threats, bringing good old Lurch back to the fray. Actually, a threat this time since there's no piano in the vicinity. To which Strange retorts with... <laughs> you think you're the only one with a brainless Neanderthal body dog? <laughs> I... I don't like the use of Neanderthal in that sentence, but sure, it's the clash we've been waiting for. Build up in just character design alone and that one look to each other at the baby beauty pageant, it's the finale fight sequence, I guess. Oh, this is gonna be rich! Oh. They really were gonna make out. Well, this is a $23 million budget, so I guess there's not the funds for it, really. So, get this. 
It was all planned, not from Wednesday. Turns out the two had a heap of conversation and a whole load of history too. I don't know if this was meant to be telepathic or just an off-screen thing that Lurch explained later or what, but it's a whole thing the writers have pulled entirely out of their asses. Pongo told Lurch that he suspected I was in danger. Pongo and Lurch are former cellmates at the asylum where Lurch was held captive. This is just made up. Also, where is Lawyer Boy now? Is he dead? Yeah, I guess he is dead. Oh my god, it, like that, they just actually killed him. Wednesday has a body count. But back to Pango, a way to write themselves out of a fight and instead turn it into a bull game. As Cyrus is played around by the two brutes and inexplicably breaks free the Adams family. <laughs> And just as the family are reunited and happy, of course, bad guy villain gets a taste of his own medicine with the super brute formula that makes him an animalistic amalgamation. Cursing the name of Wednesday, expositing that the DNA test was false, I still don't see how, praising their new cursed form and vowing to kill the entire family. If only there was a character who's inexplicably not here and established to be a transformed animal monster too. Get ready to cry, uncle! Maybe on a $23 million budget, maybe now I can, except skipping that earlier fight if the real final showdown is here. And so they brawl. They slash and they slap. It's, it's mostly just slaps and slashes. The animal family get involved too in places. The choreograph's pretty simplistic, but hey, I guess it gets the job done as strange is dragged underwater. Get him, faster! Eat him! Eat him! Before finalizing out of a flooding of the lab, everyone running and the monsters being hurled into the sea. It's a victory for Festa. <laughs> That's what victory sounds like. And now Festa is dying, and there's only one thing that can fix it. The final MacGuffin left for the film to establish that randomly placed heirloom, the Adams, but maybe not Adams necklace. From every Adams born into the family, your father, Pugsley, you... But it was handed down by your mother? No? This is all stupid anyway, and very not consensual to take your baby's blood for storage since Wednesday clearly doesn't know about this. But it'll have Festa's DNA in it too, so it's of course the instant cure needed, as Festa slowly shrinks away back to his original form, and somehow doesn't also become the others because it's the DNA mixed together. As does Ophelia. <laughs> Wait, what? I thought she was a pig first. She came from a farm, no? Strange said they always revert back to their original form, so she became a pig again, right? If they revert to original form anyway, wouldn't she have remained more human in this game? None of this stupid movie makes sense. Pugsley's girlfriend will disappear if they make a third movie anyway. It happened to Fester after the last one, after all. I just spilled my drink. And thus, the Adams say their love yous, everyone's happy, they're as a united family again, happy ending, yada yada. Except for that one other bit back at the house. <laughs> Which of course comes to zero anger from the parents and acts as our end of movie dance sequence with Snoop Dogg It back, who knows where he went for a secret gig, like your typical Illumination or old school DreamWorks movie. They've seen that the formula works and boy are they gonna bring it back. Hotel Transylvania style. What's more, there's actually a real lot of serious flashing imagery. I don't just mean like the coloured lights you're seeing on screen, I mean full on three frames of just blank white and one frame shot switching back and forth. Literally a couple of Halloweens ago I remember needing to edit a horror movie to slow down any epileptic imagery because they may be in my audience and the chance of epileptically sensitive people coming to see Adam's Family 2 isn't zero. Seems kind of irresponsible to put in this level of strobe lighting since there is no warning and what I've trimmed out here is more than fine enough on its own. Oh but hey, they do actually call out that original DNA test issue from before. Glad someone noticed, eventually. Lost my beautiful, beautiful hair. Hair transplant. I guess it'll do. <laughs> Maybe she should have checked more hair here after all. And from there in our credits, on top of being the classic theme as is standard, they next go on a vacation across the globe. Thankfully, there's no third movie to confirm it as proof. Yeah, I'll spare you from all that. Adam's Family 2 is just like Adam's Family 1. Textbook. Beats happen, nothing too crazy or new, with a lot of doll incorporated in. Missed potential, boring camera. So like, I edit these movies by cutting at every shot, and typically, YouTube doesn't like me playing more than six seconds at a time, and that's, that's pretty easy when you cut at every cut in a movie, right? 
Not this one. So, so, so many shots are slow. I'm talking 8 to 12 seconds regularly. Not even talking about the particularly long takes or slow droning shots. This movie is like the boring cousin to Hotel Transylvania with all the same flaws as Hotel Transylvania. It's just not good. But hey, nice to have a memory we could look back upon, no matter how terrible. Hmm, maybe they knew all along. And it seems MGN finally recognized that since they haven't made a third two years later again. What a relief. So for now, my name's been Daz. You didn't really care. Let me hear your seasonal suggestions for what you'd like to see in the future. And I'll see you in a bit. That covers us quite nice. I have one dandruff piece that has been here the entire time. Are you kidding me? Great. <laughs>